my dears, I have seen way too many videos recommended to me on YouTube about how every person in Gen Z wants to fake disorders for clout on TikTok and then tying that into Munchausen syndrome and then that's re-sparked conversations about Munchausen by proxy because there are always conversations about Munchausen by proxy and your boy has opinions and yeah. So I wanna give a quick trigger warning for this one. We will be talking about patterns of abuse, specifically child abuse, medical gaslighting, self-harm, a little touch of imposter syndrome. You know, not the greatest of, of things. I'm gonna try my best not to tell specific stories about these patterns of behavior um, because they're kind of upsetting and I think that I can say everything that I want to say without doing that, but still the general behaviors without examples might be triggering to some people. So if you want to skip this video, that's super cool. I totally support you on that. Also audio description for friends who need it. I am a white person in their early 20s with brownish, blondish, curly, kind of all over the place hair. I'm currently wearing a mismatched outfit that is a like navy blue Icelandic sweater with a pattern on the top. And then you can see the collar of a green shirt that is a leaf pattern and they very much clash with each other, but I'm cold. So sorry about that. And I am sitting in front of a bookshelf that has books on it as shelves often do also a picture. And then there's a bunch of pictures on the wall behind me. And those pictures are of plants if you care. And some of them are of Italy. Anyway, um, yeah, if you're new here, <laughs> Hi, my name is Sydney, I use they, them pronouns, um, and I like to take regular things that people think about and then insert either a scientific or media analysis into it for no reason. Or I find some really random niche thing that absolutely nobody thinks about and then I become obsessed with it for a very short period of time. It's usually psychology or neuroscience or autism or disability related. Occasionally queer stuff. We're dipping into the queer category more recently since I've come out as trans, also media analysis, I need to get better at making an elevator pitch of my channel. This video is a mess thus far, uh, but you should subscribe if you want to hang around. But also no pressure. As a sort of blueprint of sorts for the video, we're going to talk about Munchausen's and Munchausen's by proxy, which have been renamed. We're going to talk about that too. Um, whether those disorders are actually really disorders and the implications of the existence of said disorders um, and how that ties into the whole Gen Z TikTok trend thing. So. If you were here for the, you know, gory details of Munchausen's by proxy, know that you're getting an analysis of society as a whole through the lens of a flawed diagnosis. Um, I hope that you're cool with that. I will link videos on the gory details of Munchausen's by proxy in the description for you if that's what you are going for instead. Now, first of all, what is Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is a mouthful. MBP as we're going to call it, is the Wikipedia rabbit hole that you went down one day at like 1am and still don't know how you got there. Or maybe that's just me, who's done that several times. Though in all seriousness, Munchausen is basically faking your own illness in order to deceive others. And this isn't like when you, you know, lie to get a day off of work because you're just like tired. It's, it's like pretending that you have chronic illnesses or whatever. Sometimes people will induce their symptoms. Sometimes they're just straight up lying. It depends on the case. The three main symptoms of this disorder are one, the patient never gets better or doesn't respond to the regular treatment for the illness that they claim to have. Two, the patient will be really knowledgeable about their treatment and illness and whatnot. And three, the patient will have a lack of visitors or attention or people generally interested in their case, which supposedly proves that by keeping to themselves and keeping themselves isolated, they're trying to cover up a lie. I don't get that one. But anyway, Munchausen, Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy is basically when the non-existent illness is put onto somebody else who's usually gaslit into believing it themselves. This is usually children or elderly people, elderly people in the care of others. It's a form of caregiver abuse. We'll get there. I'm going to try to speak words better now. Um, so there are some, uh, there are many famous cases of MVP, the most famous being the story of Dee Dee Blanchard, which is not her real name, and her daughter, daughter Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Um, this was then made into a very popular, I want to say Hulu TV show. It's called The Act. I've heard it's really good. I'm not going to watch it. Um, but as interesting as Munchausen's by proxy is, can we honestly and truthfully call it a mental illness? There's a very fine line between this syndrome and just gaming the system for personal gain. The nature of this disorder is in the intention behind the actions taken, which is kind of strange in my opinion, though I also feel like there are definitely other disorders that are probably 
in the personality disorder category that work kind of the same way, but the fact that personality disorder also should exist is a completely different discussion for a different video. Still should not set a precedent for this one. Now, when it comes down to the numbers, 97% of the cases that we see of MBP, that's what we're calling it now, are mothers abusing their child. And if a man has MBP, it's usually in a cult leader situation. So what can we learn from that? We learn that we hold different standards for women and men in caregiving situations. And also if a mother abuses her child, it must be a mental illness because that's just, it's just not in a mother's nature. Why would she do that if she were not sick in the head? Um, because we love to assign mental illnesses to people whose actions make us uncomfortable so that we can see them as a them and us as an us and think that we can't do those things. But we're going to talk a little more about that one in a little bit. What I'm trying to say here is that if you look at MBP from a different lens, you realize that it's more a pattern of abuse than a mental illness. Sure, some of these people might believe their own lies, but in most of the cases that we see, in order to keep the lie going, they continuously mess with the treatment that they're giving their child in order to make them more ill. So I think they're pretty conscious of what they're doing. Typically when a behavior is a mental illness, it means that they're not capable of controlling or comprehending their own actions. And I really don't think that that would apply in this case. And also I don't know how to phrase this in a way that doesn't make it seem like a contemplated version of abusing people. I swear I haven't. I absolutely promise you. Um, but from the perspective of the mother involved, the child is completely and totally reliant on them, which means that they therefore have full control over them. And at the same time, the parent gets all of the clout and all of the sympathy about how hard it must be to be the parent of a disabled and sick child. So rather than a mental illness, I think that we can argue that this is just medical abuse. And the thing to note here is that medical abuse is effectively using power and control to make somebody sick in order to keep power and control. At the core of it, abuse is keeping power and control. And that's also how gaslighting abuse works. And in the medical sense, you might get somebody to think that they're sick. And it's also, frankly, how every other kind of abuse works too, because well, the body and emotional brain are so incredibly intertwined that even psychological, like exclusively psychological abuse will become medical abuse at some point because in almost all cases, it's going to cause physical symptoms, whether that's the occasional stomach ache from anxiety or an induced chronic stress disorder causing their digestive tract to shut down. Not that I would know anything about that. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that using the vague definition of MBP, we could kind of argue our way into saying that physical abuse or psychological abuse is in the same category, which means that those must be mental illnesses too, right? Now, an interesting argument that I saw somebody bring up probably in the comments of one of the videos that I watched, honestly, um, is that typical cases of MBP look like the stereotypical autism mom, but on steroids which got me thinking about how many autism moms make their whole identity about how they have an autistic kid, but also how so many of them act like their kids are so much worse than they are, or they'll continue to encourage negative behaviors and also simply refuse to give their children accommodations. Would that be considered medical abuse or MVP? I mean, obviously it's awful and it's horrible, but like, where does that fit in here? Or if a parent verbally berates their child just before they go in to get their neuropsych testing done, they'll behave differently than normal and then they may get diagnosed and treated for a disorder that they simply don't have, which is going to change their entire trajectory in life. At what point does that have to do with interfering in their medical care in addition to just being plain abusive? And a big issue with the diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy is the legal stuff. On one side, it's often used as an argument to get abusers off the hook for harming their children because they're labeled as people who just, they can't help it. They have a mental disorder. But on the other side, this diagnosis is often used in the court in the sense that like a doctor will come in, we'll talk about how MBP exists and how if you have it, which this scenario seems to indicate that you have it, you're therefore sick and you will harm a child no matter what, so you need to go to jail, even if that's nowhere near the case of the situation. Also, just naming that a often contested disorder exists does not seem like a good way to decide whether somebody is innocent or guilty, but also we're beginning to learn that lesson um, with shaken baby syndrome, which if you don't know about that controversy, I'll link a thing in the description for you. Um, it's kind of interesting. It doesn't really exist in the way that we uh, thought it did. Um, but I would also appreciate if we just stopped assigning mental illnesses to things that we don't like um, and also using them in court just to define people as bad people because it further stigmatizes mental illness as a whole and it also means that people don't take the time to evaluate their own actions and motives because they're like, nah, all the bad people are the mentally Ill, Ill ones and I can't be mentally ill so I have to be fine and not abusive and then continue to be terrible to people. So 
Here's your unfriendly reminder that you can be an abuser to anyone. Even, even the nicest people can be an abuser. If you don't check yourself and those around you, it can happen. Mental illness can sometimes be a factor in that kind of behavior, but if you are mentally ill, you are not an abuser, and not all abusers are mentally ill. Though also, one could argue that every human being is mentally ill because nobody makes it out of this life alive. It's kind of... I meant to say unscathed, not alive, but both of those things are true. That's a conversation for another day. Now, what I was able to find when I was going through all of this research myself was that psychologists know that it is a form of child abuse. They just also consider it a mental illness at the same time which I have opinions about, but let's talk about the name change. So the American Psychiatric Association changed the name from Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy to factitious disorder imposed on oneself or factitious disorder imposed on another in the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. Um, if you're unfamiliar with my foe, the DSM, um, that is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and it's the really big book that every psychologist uses to diagnose people with stuff. It's super flawed. You can also find a free PDF online. Um, I've complained about this before. You can watch it up here. But what is the difference between factitious and MVP? Basically, they changed their name because the original name for the disorder, Munchausen's, was named after a German soldier whose name was Munchausen, um, and he was known for telling wildly false tales, and that was inherently stigmatizing the disorder itself. Also, factitious disorder takes the stigma off of the person telling the lies and instead focuses on the negative behaviors associated with that, which makes it less of a personal failing and more of a behavior that can be worked on and something that we can learn from. So why they chose to change the name Munchausen's and not the fact that there's an entire section of the book called personality disorders is just beyond me, but we're moving on. We're moving on. It's important to acknowledge that we have been talking at this point almost exclusively about the by proxy disorders, but they also exist to yourself. That's a way to put it as well. In today's world, we actually see that a lot more frequently. And it's important to mention that factitious disorder is different from malingering. Uh, malingering is an intentional feigning of physical or psychological symptoms motivated by an external incentive like attention or money or just simply getting out of things that you don't want to do or whatever. Um, I think that every single sitcom from the 90s has some episode where the character gets the flu and then they get a lot of soup and love and attention and care so then they pretend to be sick way longer than they're actually sick because they want to keep being treated that way. That's not factitious disorder. The symptoms of factitious disorder are a lot more specific than Munchausen, which I really appreciate. Um, they include a medical history that includes one or more previous serious or dramatic illnesses, a history of seeking treatment with many different doctors and or many hospitals or clinics, having an extensive knowledge of medical terminology and knowing textbook descriptions of illnesses and symptoms, being willing or eager to have medical tests, um, be ho hospitalized or have surgery, New symptoms will appear after receiving a negative test result um, or after a diagnosis is ruled out and the patient doesn't get better even after having appropriate treatment. With malingering the symptoms, I don't know why the internet lists them as symptoms. I don't know if this is technically a disorder, but whatever. Symptoms is there's a difference between the person's stated injury or illness and the findings of a professional, refusal of appropriate treatment for the illness that they claim to have, and involving a lawyer early on in the diagnostic process, which kind of indicates a financial motive. Now, the fact that they had to include a lawyer as one of the symptoms is really fascinating to me. But anyway, incidences of factitious disorder are considered to be pretty pretty rare. And I would also argue that many of the diagnoses of this disorder are also misdiagnoses of chronically ill people, because here's the thing, if you've ever experienced trying to get diagnosed with a chronic illness that you are very sure that you have, you kind of end up being gaslit into thinking that you're not experiencing symptoms um, at the majority of the doctors that you go to, because biases happen, so that means that you're going to hop from doctor to doctor to specialist to specialist, and you're end up going to end up getting frustrated by this, and so you're going to end up doing a lot of research yourself and try to go, hey doctor, I think this might be the thing that we should try this treatment because I think it's going to help me. And a lot of times we go on treatments that don't work for us, so we don't get better and maybe even get worse. And while we may seem willing or eager to have medical tests, be hospitalized or have surgery, that's often a coping mechanism to act like you're okay with it when you're actually terrified or finally being happy that somebody is actually listening to you because it doesn't happen often. And I'm not saying that factitious disorder doesn't exist and isn't serious and terrible for people struggling with it. 
it is, but I'm also saying that, oh, they're just faking it, should not be the first conclusion at all whatsoever. And that is why this conversation is important and why we're having it. Because the popularization of the stories of Munchausen syndrome make people think that it is really common. It makes people think that people are faking disabilities just to get benefits or to get special treatment or to get out of things they don't want to do. Which has always been fascinating to me because one, doctors can see through BS. Two, doctors don't even write notes about disability for real disabilities because they don't believe us and it's impossible to get care. Three, benefits for disabled people are not enough to live on. And four, you, most people cannot get married um, without losing their benefits in many countries. Yeah, and the process to get these benefits is traumatizing and arduous and exhausting. And honestly, if an able-bodied person managed to do all of that and cheat the system at the end of the day, honestly, if they're that dedicated, I don't care. Like, just whatever. I'd rather have like three fakers slip through the cracks than tons of people who actually need it not getting the care and support they need. Though honestly, there are probably zero fakers getting benefits because they're not worth it. Not to mention that the expenses of the process of getting to that point of receiving benefits is a lot and also there are for sure tons of people who are not actually getting the support and care that they need because of this. And the popularization of this super rare condition has made doctors feel the need to gatekeep diagnoses, meaning that chronically ill people are just constantly accused of being attention seeking or faking their own illnesses or liking to rack up diagnoses or being pushy for trying to get a bunch of tests done, even though many chronic illnesses take five to 10 years to get diagnosed because of the wait time for specialists and ruling out other possibilities. So because of that, we don't get the care that we need. And, and we also feel like we're not being listened to. And a lot of us eventually just give up. Or the thing that we know that we have, but everybody else tells us that we don't have uh, the amount of time it takes to get believed and diagnosed with said thing is the amount of time it takes the disease to progress enough to the point where we're sick enough that it, we can no longer function. And the window for treatment is closed because that also happens a lot, especially if you're queer, trans, autistic, perceived to be a woman, a person of color, a child, or a big old mix of all of them. And for kids, when parents come in saying something seems wrong with my kid, they also have a harder time being listened to and getting care for their child because of this. And as a former child myself, going into specialist office was really scary. And I let my parents do the talking for me because I would often get so anxious that I would just go nonverbal. That happens to me. And that was seen as a problem because my parents were talking for me. And again, added to the skepticism I was already met with just by thinking that I may have had a chronic illness as a small child. And we all, including doctors, know that these conditions are really rare. We do. But in the same way that just by watching TV, we've all kind of internalized that autism is synonymous with a cis white boy who likes trains and numbers, even though we know that it's so much more than that and that that's a very small subsection of the population. In that same way, people have also internalized that this super rare disorder, which in the proxy case is probably just abuse and not mental illness, is really common. And therefore, we should be skeptical of every single person that we see in the world rather than, you know, let's do a little check on every kid that we see, make sure that they're okay, um, and otherwise trust that if they're willing to spend the god awful amount of money on trips to the doctor and they don't have a prior history in their chart of potentially screwing people over, that you should probably believe them. Because this thing is the reason that people don't get life-saving diagnoses and treatments every single day. And it bothers me to no end. But also it's not just the diagnostic process. And we know this. Enter the whole trend of making YouTube videos about how Gen Z can't stop faking disorders for clout on TikTok that we've all seen on our recommended page. It has become a trend to watch creators and try to spot who is faking and who isn't faking and be like, well, actually people with insert disorder don't do this. So this person must be faking. And I don't, I don't understand why people think that this is a fun game or that it's okay because as a disabled creator and also just regular human, I live in constant fear that somebody's going to decide that actually I don't have my disabilities. Because to you guys, the people watching, I seem like a fully regular functioning person. You rarely see my tics or stims on camera and I always seem full of energy and my memory seems pretty decent. But what you don't realize is that my memory seems pretty decent because I have figured out a way to work all the way around it so you can't really tell and also I script all of my videos. You don't see my tics or stims because 
A, you don't see the bottom half of my body where my hands are flapping around all the time and you can't tell, and B, I also don't tick or even need to stim really while I'm performing, so that's a thing. And my energy level doesn't negate my chronic fatigue, it just shows you that I am a very positive person and a great actor, because that's my job. Also, chronic illnesses ebb and flow, and so sometimes I will go a few months without ticking at all, and then all of a sudden have a tick attack for like four days straight. And some of my conditions are also non-disabling now, because of how much I reorganize my entire life around them so that they don't become an issue. And the fact that I appeared non-disabled on camera or in person is the product of years of work and a lot of preparation and recovering behind the scenes that you simply don't see. And if you didn't know, ambulatory wheelchair users are a thing, um, people who occasionally need mobility aids are a thing, people who occasionally use alternative communication methods are a thing. That's very normal and this doesn't mean that we're faking, it means that we're human beings who experience ups and downs and get tired sometimes and have energy other times. That's how illness works, that's how life works. And it makes people think that they have the ability to tell if somebody is faking or not, and therefore deny them the care or accommodations that they may need. Not to mention that because we hear about fakers on the news and whatnot more than we hear about not fakers, because hearing about a disabled person who just is disabled would be a pretty bad news story. People think that they're, these things are more common than they are and are therefore super skeptical of every single disabled person that they come across. And here's the deal. There's always going to be fakers. Just like some people continue to queer bait because it gets them attention, there is a certain level of intention and pity that's put upon disabled people that, for people who are used to being treated unkindly or outright ignored in life, is appealing. And this will always be the case no matter what. But also, if we started treating all humans, regardless of ability, as real people with equal and important needs and appreciate everybody's own quirks and make everything accessible to everyone, the instances of people doing this would be infinitely less frequent. And the thing that worries me most about all of this is that it gets super internalized. And it makes us think that maybe we are mentally ill and we're faking it for attention. Let's give a personal example, why not? Um, if I'm in a situation, whether it is a friendship or a relationship, where the other person pays a ton of attention to me and dotes on me and is super caring and loving and all of that stuff whenever I'm in crisis, but then just kind of is doesn't spend a lot of time with me when I'm not in crisis, my brain very easily rewires to go, they only like you when you're sick, and that means I automatically put less care into making sure that I keep myself out of crisis. And inevitably, that's gonna make me a lot sicker, like, really quickly. And on the other hand, if somebody completely denies my disability and therefore my accommodations, I feel the need to prove to them that I am really sick and I will do the same thing. And while from the outside it may seem like, yeah, I have control over my own actions, from the inside, I really don't. It's like a weird form of executive dysfunction where I know what I need to do, but I am incapable of doing it. And I know that for people with disabilities that require constant attention and upkeep and care and whatnot, these experiences are really common. But still, I find myself convinced that this factitious disorder, you know, that I don't have these disabilities because I can be functional if I just try hard enough. And so, Anytime I feel sick, it's all my fault, and I'm either making it up or I'm causing it. And because of all this, people in the community don't really talk about how frequent these feelings are because we know that if we admit that sometimes we feel like maybe we cause our own flare-ups, that we will be denied accommodations and the care that we need because we could be fine if we tried hard enough. And the more that people talk about Munchausen syndrome and whatever, the more that I mean, even researching this video, the more I start to convince myself that maybe I'm just a compulsive liar, maybe I do have this disorder because I know more about my diagnoses than my doctors have ever known, and I've stopped seeking treatment for my disabilities, opting to handle them on my own. Maybe that's a form of self-harm and self-sabotage, even though I know that it's just me realizing that constantly seeking a cure for something that isn't curable is emotionally and physically draining, but what if it's just self-harm? and is this only because doctors aren't giving me the diagnoses I want to hear and I keep trying to, you know, like, maybe I'm not disabled at all and I'm just mentally ill and lying for attention and causing it myself and now I'm making videos about it. And especially with the constant threat of other people picking me apart and explaining to me to my face, which has happened before and will happen again, why I'm not disabled and I don't need accommodations, this is a spiral that I get into a lot. So, what I'm about to say is as much for myself as it is for you guys. If this is your experience, you are 99.9% .9 of the time not making it up. You are a human trying to deal with a chronic disability. And because it is an everyday thing that you have to do and you are a human being, sometimes you're gonna mess it up. 
That does not mean that your disability is all in your head and you're causing it and it's your fault. And if you're convinced that you're causing it because you don't want to take care of yourself or you're purposefully self-sabotaging things, look around you to try to figure out why your environment is making you feel the need to do that to yourself and see if you can kind of try to change it in some manner. For me, usually this is a symptom of a combination of burnout and falling into a pattern of insecurity where I only see my worth as it's reflected in other people. Because if other people only want to spend time with me when I'm sick, then being sick is the better choice. And in that pattern of thinking, if other people only want to spend time with me when I'm sick, being sick is a better choice and why put in the effort to not be sick. And it's harder to see that as self-harm than your typical self-harm things, but it is a form of self-harm and you should be hyper aware of when you find yourself doing that, especially because it is the majority of the time a direct result of how your environment is treating you. And I will say this over and over again to myself, but also because you deserve to hear it too, um, just because it is technically self-harm that does not mean that you're defective or you're broken or that it's your fault that you are doing that or feel the need to do that to yourself. Sometimes it's just a pattern that we fall into because it's easier and our environment is making self-care impossible. And you deserve to be around people and in situations and places where you don't feel that way. Also, it's really easy to convince yourself that you're just faking your disabilities when they're ones that have gotten a lot better over time or that you have mostly managed because to you, they aren't an issue as much as, you know, they could be. But you know why that is? It's because you put in all of this work and all of this time and all of this energy into fixing things to make them more accessible to you so that they're almost a habit to cope with at this point. But on baseline comparisons to a non-disabled person, you're, you're still disabled and you may not even realize it. For example, shortly after my memory loss, I figured out some systems that I can't even explain to you what they are at this point um, to work around my memory gaps and my struggles in creating new memories. And at this point, I've started to convince myself that maybe I never actually had memory loss and I was just faking it to be dramatic until I remember how much work that I put in that so many other people don't ever have to do. And how I function very differently now and how after my diagnosis, I had to reframe my entire life to be accessible to my new disability that other people just don't have to go through. So while it feels like it's cured and that maybe I lied about it to begin with, it's actually just a journey of self-understanding and learning new ways to function in a way that's better for how my brain now works. So in regards to the whole Gen Z likes to fake disorders for TikTok and clout and whatnot, we live in a world where finding labels about yourself is how you find a community. It's how you find people who are like you. It's how you feel like you fit in somewhere. And much like the diagnosis of homosexual united people to the point where that diagnosis was just an identity and was taken out of the DSM, a lot of other diagnoses are starting to do the same thing. Diagnoses should not be a you are this and you are this kind of thing. The criteria are kind of vague and Humanity is so variant that it makes it almost impossible to properly categorize people. These things exist as a way to give language to somebody who's struggling so that they can understand their struggles better and learn to accommodate them so that they can live a better life. And the only reason that we have hyper-specific criteria and whatnot for disorders is pretty much for insurance purposes and legal reasons, which is a whole other can of worms for another day. But this trend of faking disorders should not be something that we look at and decide that Everybody on planet Earth is faking their disabilities. These disorders are getting too common and we should make the diagnostic criteria more specific and we should now pick apart every disabled person that we see to try to figure out who is and isn't faking and where the lie is. This should be a wake up call for us to realize that the reason that all of these people feel the need to do this and feel an affinity to groups of mentally ill people and the need for accommodations is that we're not treating humans in our society properly, especially the younger ones. Things aren't accessible, things aren't kind, people aren't welcoming or accepting. And the fact that everybody everywhere has an anxiety disorder in the younger generations should be a pretty big red flag that something is fundamentally wrong with the world and that we maybe need to do something to change it. And don't give me the whole special snowflake argument that we should tough it up because you did when you were a kid. Because first of all, times change. So it could be more traumatizing now than it was. And second of all, if you think that people today don't deserve basic kindness just because you didn't get that and turned out fine, you didn't turn out fine, I'm sorry, but it's the case. And when it comes to MVP and factitious disorder, yes, these things do exist because abuse and self-harm very much exist. And these are simply medicalized forms of that, more or less. But I also think that in the case of kids, we should believe first and give the treatment while also being generally aware and making sure that the kid is okay. And in the case of factitious to oneself, we should also check in to make sure that people, again, 
are okay. Because frankly, I think that the medical field focuses a lot on the, how can we cure the physical symptom and not the, how are you feeling about this? Because if you have a conversation, you can kind of understand what their motives are. Either way, if we help people to feel seen and heard and valued in the world and give people the tools to unlearn patterns of abuse, these things probably wouldn't exist as much either. Like, I get that stories like the Dee Dee Blanchard story and whatnot are compelling, believe me, um, but I think that it's important to have a discussion about what harm we may be causing by continuously platforming these narratives and, in general, calling every human trait we don't like a disorder, because it's probably causing way more harm than good. So when in doubt, believe people and listen to them and give them accommodations and care, because it's much better to validate 99 people and have one slip through the cracks and whatever and get benefits they don't deserve than traumatize 99 people to catch the one. Also, there's not really specific data on how common factitious is, and I think the data that we do have is probably pretty biased because doctors don't like to believe minority patients. But what I'm trying to say here is just be a decent human being. Um, don't pick people's outward appearances apart to try to find clues that they are faking. Um, and if you're disabled yourself, don't do that to yourself either. You deserve accommodations. You deserve people who care for you all the time, not just when you're sick, like all the time. Um, and you shouldn't settle for anything less because you are lovable and worthy and deserve to be cared for like a regular human being, because you are. So with that, thank you for listening. Thanks for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. And I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.